Man, it's a joy to be with you. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in, in the Gospel of John. Get your Bibles, turn to the book of John, and uh, excited to be going through this book with you. And as you're turning there, if you just allow me to pray and uh, ask the Lord to bless the preaching of His Word, okay? Let's pray together. Father, thankful for your goodness to us. Uh, so many blessings, so, so many great mercies on our life, millions that we don't even consider. How great is our God and worthy to be praised. And so, Father, I pray that this sermon does just that, just exalts Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, our hope, our future, our everything. And I pray, God, through the foolishness of preaching, you would ordain the salvation of souls. That if there's someone here that doesn't know Christ, they would hear the gospel and come to faith in Jesus. I pray through the foolishness of preaching, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would edify and encourage your church to continue to be a witness for Christ in this world. Light in darkness. And so, God, we pray you would have your way in us as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we are starting on a journey and, uh, you know, we've planned out how long this journey It's going to take, take us a while to get through the book of John, but that's our plan, Lord willing. Of course, we take breaks, you know that, but uh, we're starting on the gospel of John and, uh, you know, we just finished First Timothy and that was great, uh, but I'm really excited about John and, uh, and, and getting into this book. And, uh, and just spending some good time in, in the gospel. Now, one thing that I love about John and uh, that, that, that John does in, in his letters is you never have to wonder or, 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 or try to figure out why did John write this letter? John tells us. He always tells why he wrote this letter. Specifically, John, fast forward to the end of the book, John uh, chapter 20, verse 31 says, these things, his book, his letter, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's pretty clear, right? I mean, I love that. John, why'd you write a letter? Well, I told you to read it. Read it right there. He's writing this book particularly for evangelistic purposes, that whoever would read this letter or whoever would in that time have the letter read to them would know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believe in Him and have life in Him. And, and so our goal, my goal in preaching this gospel is that same goal, that, that if you're in here and you don't know Christ, that you would come to believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, and he's the Son of God, and, and that uh, and only in him can you have life. Or if you've believed for a long time that, that, you know, that this book would accomplish the purpose of giving you greater life in Christ and more life in him. And, uh, and, and so that's my hope in, in this book. Now, that said, let me also give a small infomercial to Easter service coming up. Obviously, we have, we're celebrating Easter together on the 31st of, of this month. We'll do Good Friday here as well. We'll do it in the theater at 6 p.m., I think, uh, that Friday night. But then on Easter, on the 31st, we're going to have two services, 9 and 10.30. And, uh, and, and particularly in that service, we're going to be in John 3. And John 3 is the story of Nicodemus. Some of you know this story, are familiar with it. But the story of Nicodemus where Jesus explains to him that in order to have eternal life, one must be born again. And we're going to talk about what that means. Yeah, so it's essentially the gospel. How is one saved? How does, how does one come to faith in Christ? How is one born again? We're going to be talking about all of that. And so there is no greater time to invite someone to come be a part of our gathering uh, than, than this Easter. And so send the text, um, make the phone call, knock on the door, whatever it takes to get someone here, to take advantage of the opportunity to invite someone that doesn't have a relationship with Christ into this place so they might hear the gospel. And uh, Easter is a great time, great time to do that. So, all right, that, that's the infomercial. Let's dive into the text. Again, if you've got your Bibles, John 1 is we're starting now. I want to be clear, this is, the, this is the Apostle John that's writing the letter. And in case you're unfamiliar with Scripture, the, the, uh, the, the John that we're in is in the beginning of the New Testament, the fourth book of the New Testament, uh, not 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which is 
later in the New Testament, okay? Uh, so in case you're confused as to that. Uh, but John 1, and I'm going to start in the, the first few verses here. Beautiful passage of Scripture. Hear this word. Hear the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. First point I want to have uh, us realize, pretty evident from the text, but Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Now, now who, who Jesus is, is a very important question. A.W. Tozer says, what do you think about when, when you think about God is the most important thing about you? This is true of Christ. What you think of who Jesus is matters. And oddly enough, you have to do some pretty awkward twisting of the scriptures to get a different result than Jesus is God. But there are people that do it. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they have taken Jesus and stripped him of his divinity. And uh, matter of fact, they, they retranslate that passage to say, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. And this is obviously a misappropriation of the misinterpretation of the text uh, because they're they're stripping Jesus of his deity, that he is not God um, and that he was created. And so, uh, you know, obviously a a major twisting of scripture in that instance, but in the whole of scripture as well, uh, to say something other than Jesus is God. Now, 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 this is John's birth narrative. Now, it's not like the birth narrative you're going to find in Matthew. It's not like the birth narrative you're going to find in Luke. Matter of fact, it starts way before those do. Uh, he starts his, his long before Christmas night, 2,000 some years ago. Uh, he, he starts before time. And so let, let, let's kind of look at that in detail. It says, in the beginning was the word. Well, who's the word? Let's make this clear from, from the start. Well, the word is Jesus. That becomes abundantly clear in verse 14. And, and we'll talk more about that when we get to that in a moment. Uh, but, but he is the word. And so it says, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning of what? Well, the beginning of time, of existence, of all we know on the earth. Um, he was there, right? And, and notice, that, notice that the text says, the word was. Like, uh, this is pointing to the eternality of Christ he was, he's always been. I'm reminded when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he says, before Abraham was, I am. Like he, he's always been. He, he, he was, wasing since, since all time. Like before time, he was, he's not created. He's eternal. He's always been. He will always be. Uh, this is what it means to be God. Uh, he's not created uh, in, in, uh, in any sense of the word. And so uh, he didn't begin his existence sometimes later. Sometime later, he certainly didn't begin ex- his existence when he put on flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, he has always been. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is God with no beginning and no end. I want to make that very clear to you. And, and then it says, the word Jesus was with God. Now, th- again, these are some, this, this is some good theology. You know, you, you didn't come here looking for seminary, but you're getting some good stuff today. Okay, so I want you to make sure you understand these things. But this is talking about the Trinitarian nature of God, uh, that J- Jesus is God. God the Father is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. They are one God in three persons. And so when it says the Word was with God, this, this is alluding to the fact that God is three in one. In that there's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And again, one God, three persons. And that, that God the Son was with God the Father in the beginning. He's always been, right? And so John is making this clear. And then it says, and the Word was God. Again, I've kind of already spilled the beans on this, but Jesus is God. He is divine. He, he is uh, he, he is God, and, 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 and this is important. This is a common th- theme throughout John's letter. He's establishing it now, but he's going to carry it out to the in- entirety of the letter. Uh, as a matter of fact, the back half of the book is really the last, the Passion Week, the last week 
of his life leading to the cross. And, uh, and, and all of it is pointing to that Jesus is, is God. And, and specifically, John wants to make it clear that the reasons for which Jesus was killed. And he, he, he spends his letter pointing to why Jesus would be killed and, uh, and what, what gets him crucified. Because, you know, a lot of people say, well, I like Jesus. He's a pretty good I think he was a good teacher. Well, you don't kill a good teacher, right? Um, you, you, you know, I like Jesus. He did, he did great miracles, right? He, he turned two fish into the golden corral, right? Like he, he, he did great things. I like him. Well, you don't kill someone uh, who does miracles, well, Jesus was a good guy. He was a, he was a moral guy. You know, he, he, he was perfect, right? He, 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 he walked on the uh, planet in a, in a great way. I like that. Well, you don't kill someone. Just be, you know, matter of fact, you, you do the opposite of killing someone because they don't sin. The reason Jesus was killed was because he claimed to be God. And John makes that clear throughout the entirety of his gospel. That's what gets you killed. Not being a good teacher, not doing miracles, not being a moral person. No one gets annoyed at those things. You get killed because you say, I am. I am God. That's what he, that's what he kept saying. That's what he kept teaching his disciples. That's what he kept claiming. All throughout John, you have the I am statements. I'm the bread of life. I'm the door. There's seven of them all throughout his, his letter. and He's claiming to be God. And the Jews found this as blasphemous. And this is what led them to say, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas, the robber and the thief, and crucify this blasphemer. And that's what John wants to make very clear. Now, uh, why is Jesus referred to as the word? I think it's a, it's a beautiful way, uh, but, but it's got, I think, multiple meanings here. I won't, I won't have time to deal with all of these things, but A.W. Pink says that the word is a medium of manifestation, a means of communication, and a method of revelation. Um, a, a medium of manifestation in that, you know, when we have a thought, that thought gets flesh put on it by our words, right? I can't know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking right now, when is... When, what am I going to eat for lunch? When is this God done? But you're not saying it, right? So it hasn't manifested out. So I don't know what you're thinking. But Jesus was the manifestation of the very thoughts of God. And that when Jesus spoke, it was God's word uh, coming to us and, uh, and his, you know, manifesting the very thoughts of God. So his, his medium of manifestation, he was a means of communication in that, Jesus was the divine transmitter, again, of the words of God, communicating to us the life and the love of God. And then thirdly, uh, the, the means of revelation, uh, or the method of revelation, in that Jesus fully revealed to us the attributes and the perfections of God the Father. And just to give you some verses, uh, we, we preached through Hebrews um, a long time ago now, but it says this, that he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So Jesus revealed to us, he was the exact imprint of the nature of God. He, he revealed to us the very nature of God the Father. Colossians 1.15 says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell." And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So you, so you see, again, Jesus reveals to us the very attributes, the character, the nature of God. Who is God? Well, we see it in Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. 
and we can know the heart of God, the nature of God, the thoughts of God, the attributes of God, the perfections of God by looking at the life of Christ. Now, that's why it's important to, to behold Jesus. You want to know God, be close to God, look to Christ, behold him, become like him. Um, and, and, and so this is why it's called the word. And it's through this word, if you remember, uh, it, it says it's, it's th- through this word that everything has been made that has been made. There is nothing that has been made that was not made through him. And so Jesus, you know, it's, it's, you know always around Christmas time, I always get fascinated by the thought of the incarnation when you think about that the one who made everything and through whom everything is made, put on flesh and dwells among us, is a baby being held and nurtured by his parents, by, by Mary uh, in particular. And so while she's holding the baby Jesus, uh, she's holding the very one who made her, <laughs> who gives her breath. And so she may have thought she was taking care of him, <laughs> but in reality, he's sustaining her in that very moment. And it's just incredible to think about uh, some of those thoughts but um but but also if you remember in the in the story of genesis genesis 1 when the very beginning of the bible in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth right it it begins to uh, list the days that he's creating things right and it says that when he creates something it says and god said let there be light and there was light and it was good the the way in which god created was god said his word with well, this word the creating element is Christ is Jesus in him and through him and for him are all things that are made there's nothing that has been made that has been made by him he is the very word creating word of God then it says that he's the light and the life in him was life scripture says now this has double meaning um, he, he, in him is physical life. Like I just said, everything has been made, has been made through him. The reason you have breath in your lungs is because he has given it to you. Uh, he, even those who would use their lips to curse God, th- those lips to be able to curse God are provided for them by Jesus. And there is nothing made that has been made that was not made through him. And so... In him, we have physical life. Secondly, we also have spiritual life, and we'll get to that in, in, in just a moment um, more specifically. But he also says that he is the true light. Now, look at this verse again. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines. I love, I love the verbiage here, uh, the language here. It shines. It, it's continuing to shine. It didn't, it, it shined. It didn't say it, it did shine. It says it shines. The light is ongoing, continuing to shine. It didn't just shine for a moment. It continues to shine into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And look, look at the language there. The darkness has not overcome it. Darkness has tried all it can to snuff out the light, and it continues to fail and will continue to fail for all time. The darkness cannot. Snuff out the light. We'll never be able to do it. Now, let's, let, let's, let's move on from there. Verse 6 says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Okay, our second point, just stopping quickly, is John, a man sent from God. I'm, going to, I'm not going to deal with John a lot this morning because next week's the, the, the end of this chapter deals more. And I'll, let me make sure we're clear here. This is John the Baptist, right? He was, this was John the Baptist who lived in the desert, ate locusts and honey, baptized Jesus, was beheaded by Herod. That's John the Baptist. John the Apostle is a different John that is writing this letter. Okay, just I want to make sure there's clarity there. Um, that John the Apostle was one of the disciples, lived to be a, 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 um, older, a long life. Uh, he was uh, likely the only disciple to live to, to a pretty old age. And, uh, and, and he's the one who's writing this letter. He also writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John at the end of the New Testament. He also writes Revelation 
uh, the last book of the Bible. So that's the Apostle John. That's not who we're talking about here. The Apostle John is talking about John the Baptist. And we'll, again, we'll do more with him next week because uh, uh, much of the rest of this chapter talks about him. Uh, but what I do want to call your attention to is it says that he's a witness to the light. He is a witness to the light. Now, John's role as witness is in a very is the very mantle that every believer should also pick up and carry. That we are called to be a witness to this truth that Jesus is God. He is light and life. He is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Everyone who believes is called to be a witness to that truth. You're called to be a witness to that truth by your life that your life and the way you live should be so different from the darkness of the world that it screams that Jesus is alive. How you work, how you speak, how you walk in your day, uh, day-to-day life, what your marriage looks like, all of that should, should bear witness to Christ, that He is alive, He is the Son of God. Uh, your words should bear witness to Christ, You should speak the truth that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the only way to be right before God forever. This is what you're to bear witness about. And and so John the Baptist gives us a great example of how we're to also live for Christ as a witness in the world. We're to be uh, his his witnesses, and our lives should bear witness to it. Okay, um, verse 9 says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We see here the true light. Jesus is the true light. What is, what is sad um, about this text to me is um, it says he was in the world as the true light, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Um, for John, the Apostle John, to have to write in here that Jesus was the true light. That light came in the world and, and that men in darkness could not even recognize what light was. They were that far in darkness. That is fascinating to me. This light shining in the darkness. And, uh, and he is that true light. He's the hope to the hopeless. He, he's the only life we have. He, he's the way to see the path unto God. He's the way to see the path to be made right under and have right standing He's the way to have right standing before God the Father. He's the light, the true light. And yet men uh, still couldn't see. And, and, and it says, and the world did not even know him. He came to his own, his own people, particularly he's talking about the Jewish nation. He came to his own people, God's chosen people, and they did not receive him. I read an illustration this week about this family who was stricken with poverty during the Great Depression. And uh, but they but but they, obviously they fell in hard times, just like everybody fell in hard times in those days. But uh, they scrimped and saved and sold things and tried to figure out a way to be able to send their son off to college. And they send their son off to college and and they made it happen. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they decide, hey, we want to go visit him. And so they again, they scrimp and they save and they they make it happen to where they go to where he is in college and be able to visit him. And his dad, coming upon him, sees him from a bit of a distance, walking with a group of friends, and he calls out to him, Hey, son, son, it's me, your father. And the son just kind of ignores him. And maybe he said, well, maybe he didn't hear me. And he says, Hey, son, it is me. It's me, your father. And the son looks at his friends and he says, I don't know that man. He's, this man must be crazy. How much, how devastating would that be to begin with? And yeah, the dad shows up. He was embarrassed by him. He probably looked malnourished and ragged clothes and dirty. But it's still his father. 
And yet he, he pretended not to know him. How much greater when Christ comes to his own people. And not only do they not know him, but they kill him. I mean, you gotta, you got to remember that these were uh, the very people of God. The, the whole Old Testament, the prophecies, the, the, the foreshadowing, the promises, the, the, the commandments, the covenants, uh, the miracles, all done by Jesus and for Jesus. It's all, all the Old Testament is about Jesus. And they missed it. They didn't see it. And, and G, Jesus said they, they did not. They didn't, they came, he came to his own people, and his own people did not know him. But then we have one of the greatest buts in the Bible. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. If you underline, underline that. In verse 13, too, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Those who did receive him, who believe in his name, have been given the right to be called the children of God. What a great mercy from God. What a great blessing. There was no other way. No other way to be made right with God. God made a way by sending God the Son to give sinners and rebels adoption rights. We were not sons. We were not daughters. And Jesus laid down his life in order for you to be called a son and a daughter. All who did receive him were given the right to bear the name of Christ. Given the right to be called the very children of God. Those who believe in his name are God's children. Are God's people. And then John tells us exactly how this was accomplished. He says, it was not by blood. Meaning, ethnically, being Jewish didn't make you saved. That's what he was making clear. But for our context, you know, it also doesn't matter if you come from a long line of a Christian family. Your grandmama's faith will not be accredited to you as righteousness. It's not by blood that you're saved. You're counting on someone holier than you, being related to you. It's not going to work. It's not by blood that you're saved. It was not by the will of the flesh. I was listening this week. Oprah's whacked out theology about, you know, basically if you believe in something very fervently, then that, that's good enough, that surely you have some kind of eternal bliss. And um, that's nuts. It's crazy. Uh, it's untrue. But, but also, fervent belief, even of God, is not the catalyst for your salvation. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, people and churches that would teach that you'll be saved if you just want it enough, or you desire it enough, or you have enough faith. No, it's not by the will, it's not by the will of the flesh. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You can't earn it. You can't f- believe harder and God be like, all right, you believed hard enough. Come on in. It's not by the will of the flesh. It's also not by the will of man. It says that, that gave you the right to be called the children of God is not by the will of the man. You didn't choose on your own accord. You didn't figure it out cognitively and say, well, I've weighed the pros and cons between Christianity and Islam, and I think I'm going to go with Christianity. I don't have to wear the stuff, and I can, you know, it's great. I'm going to do this. No, you didn't figure it out. You, you, you weren't, you, you weren't, it wasn't because you were smart enough or gifted enough or, or even that you made right choices. Right? If, those are, if those are true, then your salvation is granted to you based on something within you, something that you did, something that you chose. And if that's the case, then it's no longer given to you by grace because you've earned it. And grace stops being grace when it's earned. It becomes a wage. You deserved it. You did this, therefore I pay you this. And it says not by the will of man. No, 
You are saved if you are saved by God's desire to save you. He opened your eyes. He gave you the gifts of faith and repentance. He took your stony heart and turned it into a heart of flesh. The the Bible says, here's what you brought to the table. Here's what I brought to the table. Spiritual death. And what choice can a dead man make? He can't even pick what he wants to be buried in. You know, his surviving wife wants to bury him in an ugly Hawaiian shirt. She can do that. He can make no choices as a dead man. It was God that gave him life. It was God that gave life to his dead heart. It was God that gave us life. It was God that gave you eyes to see and ears to hear. It was purely the mercy and the grace of God to save a wretch like us. Holy, fully, it was not the blood, not by blood, not by the will of the flesh, not by the will of man, but God. Being rich in mercy. Loved you before the foundation of the world. Set his love upon you, the scripture talks about. Sent the Holy Spirit to regenerate your heart. Give you eyes to see. That's how you can see the gospel. Like, oh, that is light and life. You can hear about Jesus and say, yes, that is true. It's because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to be able to see it. Changed your heart to be able to see it. Gave you gifts of faith and repentance. Let's finish out the text for the day through 18, starting in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Another great text um, in all the Bible. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I love what John says in 15 uh, about John the Baptist is speaking. John bore witness about him. Uh, I'm sorry. John is talking about John the Baptist and cried out. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. That's important because uh, John was six months older than Jesus. But he says he came before me. How is that possible? John the Baptist was born prior to Mary giving birth to Jesus. Six months prior. But he says he was before me. Well, he's only before him if he's eternal. And he is eternal. And he says, but in this eternal word, Jesus put on flesh and dwelt among us. God the Son, who was in glory, humbled himself, stepping down from that to put on flesh and to to dwell or to tabernacle among us. You want to talk about like, we talk about, man, we we, we may have lost everything or we, we got a different position in life. That's a completely different position. Going from glory to putting on flesh and dwelling among us. Thank you. Now, why did he do this? Why did he put on flesh and dwell among us? Well, one, he did so as an example to us. Uh, Jesus lived such a life as a model for us how to live. First John goes as far to say, if we say we are believers, we will walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, obviously, we don't do that perfectly. Chad said earlier, it's not about perfection. I like it. Someone said it's not about perfection, but about direction. And we're we're continuing to move towards more Christ-likeness. But we walk in the same way in which he walked. So he came to set an example for us to model how to live life. He also put on flesh so that he could experience life in the same way that we experience it. 
right? Jesus put on flesh so he could stub his toe and know what that's like. Now, now the difference, and this goes back to him being an example, he probably didn't say what we say when we stub our toe. But, but he put on flesh so he could experience all that we would experience. And, and the reason, a, a, a less funny example, he was tempted in every way, the scripture says. He experienced temptation as we experienced temptation. Uh, he he um, experienced betrayal. He experienced uh, frustration with teaching people that wouldn't listen. Disciple, hard-headed disciples. He knew. He, he experienced passion and zeal. You you see that he flips over tables in the temple court because they were making a mockery of the house of God. He experienced these things. He experienced anger. Now, in his anger, he did not sin. That's a hard one to do. But he did it. The Hebrews talks about, again, we preached this a while back, but he is our great high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Because he's walked in the flesh. He's had relationships with people. He's worked. He's walked in the flesh as we walk in the flesh. Um, now, this is the incarnation of Christ or the, the, uh, is one of the greatest truths of Scripture, but particularly I want to point out that Jesus was fully man. He was also fully God. Now, the theological term here is called the hypostatic union. There's mystery here. How can he be fully man and fully God? Uh, we don't understand all the, all the concepts of that, but we trust it because it's what the Bible teaches us, right? Um, but one of the beautiful things about this is him putting on, God putting on the flesh and being 100% man, experiencing the things that we experience as a man. That's what he did. That's why he put on flesh to dwell among us, so he could experience what we could experience. And then thirdly, he put on flesh so that he could die. Before putting on flesh, God could not die. He put on flesh so he could go to the cross and die. The greatest purpose of the incarnation was the crucifixion. He put on flesh so that he could taste death. Now this is what John's talking about. He says this is grace upon grace that we have received. Jesus, being fully God, became fully man, in order to taste death, to die on a cross, and to, to give us, those who would believe in him, the right to be called the children of God. You don't feel blessed this morning? You are abundantly blessed beyond measure. You feel, woe is me about your life? He has given you the right to be called the children of God. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, all glory be to Christ. Then the text says that no one has ever seen God, and yet Jesus came to make him known to us. Now, listen, guys, if that, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet, I don't know what's wrong with you. I mean, these truths about Christ are so beautiful. And so rich. Um, if you would get them, if you would hear them, if you would believe them, if you would dwell upon them, life. This is the, the purpose that John is writing. And I want to remind you of that as I close. John's not writing these things to satisfy our curiosity or to, for us to figure out all the nuances of theology in, in this text, John is writing this so that you would know that Jesus is God. He is the Christ. And if you believe in him, that you will have life. That's why he's writing to us these things, that we would believe and have eternal life. So why should you believe in Jesus? John says that he's 
provided, he's, he's greater than any prophet. He's provided for us abundant life. He, uh, there's abundant grace for those who trust in him. He's greater than Moses, the text says. He's greater than the law. He, he, he is God's ultimate revelation of himself. He is God. Now, for those who would turn away from him, to not believe he is God, not trust that they will reject Jesus. Um, and if, if, if that's you, I would plead with you to see the truth that Jesus is, is God. He is the Messiah. Do not turn away from what is the truth of the Scriptures, the whole of Scriptures. I don't care what you've heard. I don't care what you thought. I care what the Bible says. And it's very clear that the Word was God. And if you believe in Him, if you believe that He is God and that He brings life and He's the true light, if you believe these things, then He gives you the right to be called the children of God. What a grace. Grace upon grace. Let us pray together. Father, I just want to take a minute to just to begin this prayer time and just praise you. How great is our God? Um, you certainly were not required to do anything to save us from our plight of deserved damnation, judgment, and hell. And yet... In your great wisdom and mercy, sent Jesus, God of God, Son of God, to put on flesh and dwell among us. And what a, I mean, we, when we should have put on parades and sat at his feet and treasured every word that came from his mouth, he came to his own people and his own people did not know him. He came into the world and the darkness did not see the light. And so here is Jesus who walked in perfect obedience to you without sin. And he was slaughtered on a cross. Slaughtered. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we might be given the right to be called the children of God. And so in that cross, you provide for us a payment that our sins deserved from the wrath of God. You also provide for us a righteousness that is accredited to our account to make us perfect and holy in the sight of God. And that's not all. Three days later, you defeat death, sin, and the grave. Proving, once again, that what you said was true. You are God. And so we, we praise you for making a way to save sinners like us. We find ourselves in a very humble position here. And that salvation was wrought in us, not by blood, nor by the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Praise be to God. I pray this morning for those that don't know Christ. Maybe they think they do, or they thought they did. But they've never really understood the gospel. They've never trusted you in such a way that their sins have been dealt with, paid for. And so, Father, I pray that you would move in them in such a way that they would bow their knee to Christ today. I pray for the believer that you would use this text this morning to, to birth more life in them. That they would treasure what Christ has accomplished on their behalf and they would praise you with all their days. Lord, and I pray you would keep your hand on our church. 
that this message, this gospel message, that all who did receive him, who believed in his name, were given the right to be called the children of God, this would be one of our greatest proclamations every Sunday, every time we gather, that it is by the grace of God that he's made a way to save sinners like us. Glory be to God. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, who is God and the Savior of the world. In his name, amen.